Tonight at 10, chaos and uncertainty in prospect for thousands of travellers hoping to use British airports over the Christmas period. Staff at UK Border Force, including passport control officers, are planning to take action over eight days. The PCS union says the government needs to put money on the table now. Our action is designed to get the government to see sense and give our members money to stop them using food banks, which is the least they deserve. Public services will also be affected by strikes in the NHS, including nurses and ambulance workers, as well as railway staff prompting this warning from the government. The union leaders to continue to be unreasonable, then it is my duty to take action to protect the lives and livelihoods of the British public. We'll be looking at the likely effect of the strike action on those intending to travel abroad over Christmas and the New Year. Also tonight, Cumbria will be the location of the first new coal mine to open in the UK for 30 years. In Germany, an aristocrat is one of a group of far-right agitators charged with plotting to overthrow the national government. Netflix prepares to release the first instalment of its documentary Harry and Meghan, when the couple are expected to reveal more about tensions with the royal family. And tonight in Liverpool, the sculptor Veronica Ryan, whose work has honoured the Windrush generation, wins this year's Turner Prize. Coming up on BBC London, temperatures have plunged to below zero tonight. There's a cold weather warning in place as people try to keep themselves and others warm. Good evening. Hundreds of thousands of travellers hoping to use British airports over the Christmas period are facing chaos and uncertainty because of strike action announced today by staff at UK Border Force. They're planning to take action over eight days between the 23rd of December and New Year's Eve at Heathrow, Gatwick, Birmingham, Manchester, Cardiff and Glasgow airports, as well as the port of New Haven. The PCS, the Public and Commercial Services Union, says the strikes will escalate unless the government puts money on the table now, in its words. The vast majority of passport control staff are PCS members, and Heathrow has already warned of long delays on strike days. The latest action is in addition to strikes already announced over the Christmas period by rail workers and highway staff. The Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, has warned that he will introduce tough new laws to limit the impact of strikes, as our political editor Chris Mason tells us. Another day, another strike announcement. This time it is Border Force staff. Their complaint, an increasingly familiar one. We, like nurses and teachers and paramedics and other people in the public sector, have no option other than to take industrial action because our members currently are skipping meals, not being able to put the heating on at home because of the poverty they're living in. What do we want? Clear please. When do we want it? Now. And as new strikes are announced in one sector, they are underway in another. Striking teachers in Glasgow today, as thousands of pupils in Scotland missed out on a day's schooling, others will miss a day tomorrow. The teachers want more money than the Scottish Government says is affordable. It is the season across the UK of falling temperatures and fractious industrial relations. Morning, For Rishi Sunak, Parliament beckoned and he brought a promise. If the union leaders to continue to be unreasonable, then it is my duty to take action to protect the lives and livelihoods of the British public. And that's why, Mr Speaker, since I became Prime Minister, I have been working for new, tough laws to protect people from this disruption. But Mr Sunak and his team afterwards had little more to add. Asked if they might ban strikes in the emergency services, we were told they weren't ruling anything in or out. This morning, his transport secretary said that his flagship legislation on strikes, this is what he said this morning, his transport secretary, you might want to listen to this, is clearly, is clearly not going to help with the industrial action we're facing. He should stop grandstanding, stop sitting on his hands, get round the table and resolve these issues. 
As the Prime Minister attempts to show he's working up answers to this epidemic of industrial unrest, he's also facing criticism for caving in to his own side. Building wind farms like this one in East Renfrewshire near Glasgow in England will be made easier after Conservative MPs demanded it. And he's watering down house building targets in England too after, yes, Conservative MPs demanded that as well. His backbenchers threatened him. Yeah. And as always, the Blamange Prime Minister yeah. wobbled. Yeah. He did a grubby deal with a handful of his MPs and sold out the aspirations of those who want to own their own home. As ever, engaging in the petty personality politics, not, 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 not focused on the substance. Again, let me explain what we're doing. We're delivering what I said we would do. We're protecting the character of local communities. We're cracking down on land banking and irresponsible developers and we're giving people a greater say in their decisions. Labour are determined to portray the Prime Minister as weak, and his two about turns in just the last couple of days certainly helped them make that point. Little wonder then that on the issue of strikes, Rishi Sunak wants to appear tough on a theme that Labour often find awkward given their connections to the trades unions. But whilst the Prime Minister's language on strikes is tough, the detail is thin. They're simply not telling us very much about precisely what they want to do. As the groups of workers say they'll stop work grows, in here they're still working out what to do about it. As the disruption before, during and after Christmas becomes clearer. Chris Mason, BBC News at Westminster. Now Cumbria is to be the location of the first new coal mine to open in the UK for 30 years. The proposed mine near Whitehaven would produce coking coal for steel production in the UK and across the world. Supporters say it will create much needed jobs in a deprived area. The critics say that the mine will in fact hit those targets for tackling emissions and that in any case demand for coking coal is declining. Uh, the decision has divided opinion within the Conservative Party at Westminster and within the community in Cumbria as our political correspondent Alex Forsyth explains. It is a new dawn for an old industry. Beneath the seas off the sweeping Cumbrian coast, there is coal, not to power homes or business, but coking coal for steel manufacturing. It will be mined from this site, the first new coal mine in the UK for three decades. For some in Whitehaven, it's a boost for a town bruised by economic decline that's left obvious scars. And some claim a chance for the UK to reduce its dependency on coking coal from elsewhere. There is demand in the UK, but even if we become exporters of this, that is not a problem to us. I would rather the countries that are importing coking coal were importing it from the UK. There are areas in Whitehaven that are quite deprived, so that's bringing the investment right where we need it. Many here welcome talk of 500 jobs the mine could bring, though some question their sustainability. We can't see it being viable. In what way? Well, we had a huge pit and they closed it. Well, well I think you just have to look up and down King Street to see that needs a bit of investment, doesn't yeah. it? All the empty shops and it used to be a really thriving place. The mine's been controversial from the outset, facing fierce opposition from climate campaigners. It's been condemned by Labour, the Lib Dems and some senior Tories. Politically, this has been difficult and divisive, even within the Conservative Party, because the government's promised to revitalise places like this, even harder given the state of the economy, and it's committed to the goal of net zero to tackle climate change. That's why this decision's been so protracted and won't please everybody. Environmental groups say it's a backward step, claiming there's diminishing demand for this kind of coal as manufacturers move to greener methods, saying that's where the focus should be. That transition to the green economy could unlock hundreds of jobs here. We can't afford to uh, allow new fossil fuel developments um, if we're serious about uh, meeting our legally binding climate targets. But for others here, coal mining routes run deep. Dave worked in this very pit until it closed in the 80s and would welcome a return of the industry he says helped build the town. I left school with no qualifications whatsoever. And I finished up with qualifications in mine ventilation and eventually in, in mine dust control. 
And that's the type of, uh, well, opportunity that young people need. I hope one day they'll let me, allow me to go down and have a look. <laughs> the end of this industry was mired in controversy. So too is the idea of it restarting here. So further challenges are likely, but for now, coal mining set to return to Cumbria for the first time in decades. Alex Forsyth, BBC News, Whitehaven. Let's explore this a little more with our climate editor, Justin Rowlatt. A sense of the argument there, Justin, with some people saying, look, this is just one mine. It is not going to make any big difference to the wider picture. What are your thoughts on that? Well, that's certainly Michael Gove's judgment. He's looked at this and he said, well, look, it won't significantly reduce the world price of coal, therefore won't significantly increase demand. And if you think about it, on balance, that means it's effectively climate neutral. But you won't be surprised to hear a host of environmental organisations disagree with that. The government's chief advisor on climate, Dars II, Lord Deben, who chairs the Climate Change Committee, says in his judgment it will add to global emissions and will also undermine the UK's efforts to meet its carbon reduction targets. And you've also got to think about the UK's international reputation. I was at the uh, latest UN climate talks in Egypt. The UK government argued hard that the whole world, including developing countries, should phase out all use of coal. Well, lots of countries will look at that now and say, well, it's a bit hypocritical if you're going to open a new coal mine in the UK. Um, that's certainly what Alok Sharma, who led the delegation to those talks, thinks. He says this will damage the UK's reputation as a leader in the climate battle. But it isn't all over yet. Friends of the Earth, the campaigning Green Group, Group says it is looking at the possibility of challenging this in court. OK, Justin, many thanks. Justin, roll up there for us. And let's go straight to Westminster to pick up uh, on the debate there in, uh, in the world of politics. And Chris Mason joins us. Uh, Chris, where do you think this debate is going? Well, governing is about difficult choices, Hugh, demanding an examination of irreconcilable requests and trying to come to a decision, a decision with local consequence, a part of the country that has felt left behind, behind and is demanding more private sector jobs. One with national import, there's been a debate raging, hasn't there, about energy security. The idea is if you take uh, some of this coking coal out of the ground domestically, you're not having to import it from places like Russia. But then there is a decision that moulds our international reputation, as Justin was saying there. The UK wants to be seen as this global leader on climate change and then he's saying yes to a new coal mine. What is striking today is that government ministers have made this decision without fanfare. It was published on the government's website at gone six o'clock at night. There wasn't a ministerial visit to the region. Uh, there wasn't an interview. Why? Because they know that there's going to be appeal, or at least they expect that. They know this debate is just beginning to get going. And that's where it poses an interesting dilemma for Labour. They are vociferously opposed to this mine in a part of the country they want to win back. But what would they do if they were to win uh, the next election? And perhaps the shovels are in the ground but no coal has yet come out of the ground. Do they let the mine go ahead or do they stop it? The debate over coal in Cumbria is only just beginning. Chris, many thanks again. Chris Mason with the latest thoughts there on uh, that policy at uh, Westminster. Well, the Prime Minister has outlined new measures designed to tackle the mounting problems affecting the NHS in England. More than 7 million people are currently waiting for treatment and the response times for ambulances uh, have been getting worse. Rishi Sunak said that 19 new diagnostic centres in communities across England would help to tackle the backlog after COVID. And he also suggested more use of the private health sector for some operations. The Prime Minister was talking to our health editor, Hugh Pym. November alpha 332, receive him. We've been out with paramedics and seen at first hand the delays and frustrations Queues in corridors handing over patients, crowded A&E departments and long waits. What do we want? Ambulance staff and nurses are planning strikes over pay, with non-urgent care likely to be affected. More than 7 million patients are waiting for operations and other planned treatment. That's the reality of the NHS in England right now. Hi Hugh, how are you? Good afternoon Prime yeah, Minister. Yeah, very nice to see you. Thanks for coming. And the Prime Minister today unveiled plans to tackle the backlog. New community diagnostic centres mean that you'll be able to get your scan, your check, your test faster, quicker. The new elective surgical hubs mean that we can do more elective surgery to again get people the treatment they need faster. Many doctors and nurses tell us there just aren't enough staff. Why was more not done in the years leading up to the pandemic? Well, one of the big commitments that we made in 2019 at the election was to 
get 20 or 50,000 more nurses into the NHS and we're making great progress. There are a record number of GPs at the moment. But there are fewer fully trained GPs in England than there were before the pandemic. Well, at a time you, when demand for care is rising. Well, actually, if, if, you look at the, if you look at the total number of GPs that are in the system today, there are more than that there were trainees. in 2009 who, who are able to, con able to contribute. Will you apologise to the patients who've had waits of hours either waiting for an ambulance or waiting in A&E? Yes, I, I don't want people to have to wait. Will you apologise? Really well, what I think people want is actually action. Right? What people want from their politicians, what they want from me, is action to make a difference to their lives. And what I'm here to tell you is, we are going to make that difference. Mary was unwell and had a fall in the bathroom, but she had to wait five hours for an ambulance, with her husband Gordon unable to help. He felt really helpless. It was very distressing for both both of my parents um, for this to have happened and where she was just left laying on the floor for that amount of hours. Sadly, Mary died two months later. The opposition says the answer lies in getting more staff. Labour's pledged for the next election the biggest expansion of the NHS workforce in history. It's fully costed, fully funded and the Conservatives are welcome to steal it and run with it. And the sooner we get cracking with that, the better. Workforce planning is for the future. Right now, the big concern for staff is this winter. And tomorrow, there'll be a special day of coverage across BBC News on the NHS under pressure. Hugh Pym, BBC News. In Germany, 25 people have been arrested on suspicion of plotting to overthrow the national government. A group of far-right and former military figures are said to have planned to storm the Bundestag, that's the lower house of parliament in Berlin. A man named as Heinrich XIII from an old aristocratic family is alleged to have been a prominent member of the plot. Arrests were made in 11 of Germany's states and the operation involved thousands of police. Well, for the latest, let's join our correspondent Jenny Hill in Berlin. Yes, Hugh, many Germans will have been astonished when they woke up this morning, switched on their televisions or looked at their phones. Before dawn, heavily armed police officers, thousands of them, carried out raids across the country in connection with a suspected homegrown terror cell, which was allegedly planning, in effect, a coup. Now, it sounds extraordinary, astonishing, far-fetched even, but the authorities here are in no doubt that not only were their suspects serious in their intent, but also extremely dangerous. Before first light, a plot uncovered. Officers interrupting what investigators believe was a terror cell, preparing to overthrow the German government. Its members, they say, were prepared to kill to achieve their aim. According to our findings, the association has set itself the goal of eliminating the existing state order in Germany, the free democratic basic order using force and military means. This German aristocrat is believed to be one of the ringleaders. It's thought Heinrich XIII, Prince Royce, planned to install himself as head of a new German government and had even chosen a cabinet of ministers. The plot was reportedly hatched here at his hunting lodge. It sounds extraordinary, fantastical, but prosecutors say the group were serious and extremely dangerous. They'd set up a military arm, attempting to recruit from the German police force and army. Most of those arrested today are believed to be part of the so-called Reichsburger movement. The Citizens of the Reich is a loose grouping of conspiracy theorists who refuse to recognise the modern German state and reject the authority of its government. It's believed there are 21,000 of them scattered across the country and estimate that 10% are potentially violent. The Reichsburger have protested alongside Covid deniers, anti-vaxxers and followers of QAnon. They were there two years ago when a mob tried to storm the German parliament. Politicians here were already worried. Conspiracy theories, including those espoused by the Reichsburger, have proliferated here in recent years, particularly during the pandemic. That's already led to violence today, driving home once again just how potentially dangerous such disinformation can be. People here used to dismiss, deride the Reichsburger. Germany's learning, they're far from harmless. Jenny Hill, BBC News. Berlin.
Well, Jenny mentioned a disinformation there. Correspondent Mariana Spring is with me, uh, who is an expert on the way that disinformation uh, is spread. Mariana, thanks for coming in. I'm just wondering, first of all, given that you were tracking some of the groups involved here, how did these forces come together? I've spent uh, most of today with our disinformation team here at the BBC investigating who was involved and how this has played out online. Um, as we know, there were far right and military figures who were arrested and people linked to this citizens of the right group. Um, that group uh, in particular um, appears to be one that has been quite prolific on social media platforms like Telegram. And if you look in the channels linked to it, you can see um, COVID-19 conspiracy theories. You can see disinformation like the QAnon conspiracy theory related to those riots that happened at the Capitol back in 2021 in the US. Um, and I think it's important to understand that while this group predates the pandemic, um, it, it's audacious plot um, and its commitment to it perhaps goes hand in hand with the rise of disinformation about COVID-19 um, and the violent rhetoric that has accompanied that. Um, and we've had warnings before that real world action can be linked to what's being shared online, including, as we said, uh, those capital riots. Um, this again reminds us that although the pandemic in some places is easing, um, the legacy and the conspiracy legacy it leaves remains um, and it can embolden these fringe groups in a way that just happened before and that's really quite frightening. Mariana, many thanks once again. Mariana Spring there, our disinformation correspondent. Now in Northern Ireland the Assembly at Stormont was recalled today for the fifth time since the elections in May but failed again to agree on a power sharing arrangement. The Secretary of State for Northern Ireland has said members of the Assembly will have their pay cut by 27%. Northern Ireland has now been without a fully functioning devolved government since February. The Democratic Unionists decided to boycott the power sharing framework because of objections they have to the trading arrangements uh, after Brexit uh, signed by Boris Johnson's government. And the deadlock is said to be damaging public services at a very challenging time. Our Ireland correspondent Emma Vardy has more details. As winter's set in, so has a protracted stalemate in Northern Ireland's politics. While elected leaders are absent, for many people, surviving right now means working harder than ever. My wife turned him and said to me, you're doing too much. Sometimes you think, right, I, I am going to slow down a bit, but then you realise you can't afford to. In the face of rising bills, on top of running his business, Martin's taken on an extra job as a hospital porter at night. The electricity has increased, it's trebled, nearly quadrupled. Westminster's allocated extra funding to help with energy bills, but without a government, there's been a delay in getting payments to households in Northern Ireland. Having no political leadership to help mitigate the cost of living crisis is becoming a frustration for voters. They have to put their differences aside. They're going to regret not helping people. So that's me after a busy day in the coffee shop. Now I'm heading to a and &E for an ER shift. And the emergency department Martin works at was forced to close its doors recently after it couldn't take any more patients. We have seven ambulances outside and two more inbound. Doctors have repeatedly called for power sharing to be restored to help tackle some of the worst crowding there's ever been here. The reality at the moment is that we almost have a one in one out policy that we have such crowding in our emergency department that we know causes harm to patients. At what should be the seat of power, Today, parties were still unable to restore a government, while the DUP is refusing to rejoin the power-sharing executive. And the problems are compounded because Stormont is forecast to overspend by at least £330 million this year. An emergency budget's been set at Westminster. But it means unelected civil servants here are having to take political decisions about how cuts are made to balance the books. The big challenge facing... Um, it's not long ago that David Sterling was running Stormont during a three-year absence of government after Sinn Féin walked out of power sharing. What might the real impact on public services be if this situation continues? We've now had nearly four years out of the last six where we've had no ministers, and that's very evident. We have the highest waiting lists in the UK. Uh, we have a need for reconfiguration and transformation in many services, but those decisions cannot be taken in the absence of ministers. There isn't yet a clear path to a political solution. But as each day passes, the winter crisis increases the urgency for the stalemate to be resolved. Emma Vardy, 
BBC News, Belfast. Well, in New York, the uh, Duke and Duchess of Sussex have accepted an award for their work in addressing racism and mental health issues. Now, the event took place last night, just as Netflix is preparing to release the first instalment of a documentary entitled Harry and Meghan, in which the couple are expected to reveal more about the tensions uh, with the royal family. Our royal correspondent, Sarah Campbell, has the story. Arriving at this glitzy awards ceremony in New York. Harry, do you have a message for your family? Do you have a message for your family, Harry was asked. Not last night. On stage, the chat was light-hearted. I, I actually thought we were just going on date night, so I found it quite weird that we're sharing the room with 1,500 people. Um, but, um, I mean, we don't, we don't get out much because our kids are so small and young. With them, um, Kerry so Kennedy, is, who presented them with a Human Rights um, Award named nice after her father, Robert, Robert F. Kennedy. Kennedy. You know, we're so proud of their work on racial justice and on mental health parity and awareness and um, the, the multitude of things that they've done. What they've done since meeting six years ago is now the subject of a Netflix series. I realised they're never going to protect you. It is hotly anticipated and most people will have an opinion. I didn't want history to repeat itself. Self-styled reality TV queen Gemma Collins does know the ups and downs of telling your truth on camera. What on earth happened? They've got their story to tell. For some reason, they feel very wronged, which I'm looking forward to finding out why. But they can't ask for privacy when they've made the Netflix series because everyone now is opening up a can of worms. You know, you've had cameras following you around. Once you've opened that box... There's no going back. There is no going back. The series will be poured over, dissected and commented on, just as these trailers have been, with the context in which some of these images have been used open to question. From a PR perspective, there are risks. As much as someone might want to go and tell their story and their truth, someone else might have the, a different recollection and their different perspective on what happened. And people will then start questioning, questioning your truth, picking holes, picking holes in it. And if there's evidence to the contrary, suddenly it, the narrative can switch. There's a hierarchy of the family. This producer likens the series to the reality TV she's won numerous awards for. A bit like Big Brother, it's sort of who wins, you decide. You'll watch that series and think, the royal family need looking after, they've come out of it better, or you'll be on the side of Harry and Meghan and think, wow, they had to put up with the loss and I'm on their side. But this isn't reality TV, it's real life. Today, the King celebrated best business practice in Westminster. Tomorrow, he knows his family may well be a global story once again. At what point, if at all, do they decide to answer back? Sarah Campbell, BBC News. Now, in Liverpool tonight, the sculptor Veronica Ryan, who made the UK's first permanent public artwork to honour the Windrush generation, has been awarded this year's Turner Prize. The judges were praising her poetic and evocative work. This is just a very small section of a much bigger range of work. Now, the prize is awarded to a British artist for an outstanding exhibition or other presentation of their work in the preceding year. And our culture editor, Katie Razzle, was at the award ceremony uh, a little earlier this evening. The winner, Veronica Ryan. Veronica Ryan is the oldest ever Turner winner. The prize for innovation in British contemporary art, awarded to a sculptor born in 1956 in Montserrat in the Caribbean, who moved to the UK as a toddler. It's tremendous as an older artist to win a Turner Prize and to be visible and to send a message to younger artists. You have to make your work because it's important to you. Her sculptures often make reference to her Caribbean childhood. Mysterious works focused on seeds, fruit pits, pods, sometimes held in thread pouches crocheted by the artist. The judges praised her for poetic works, transforming items that are often lost or thrown away. Well, has it been a struggle to get to 66 before the proper recognition has started to come? Yeah, I mean, it's been an incredible struggle. You know, there were 20 years almost where 
no one was paying attention to my work. But I think because I grew up in a family where you recycled and you made use of things around you, I've always been, I think you just use what you have. Before this prize, Ryan was best known for the first permanent work in the UK honouring the Windrush generation. Her sculptures of Caribbean fruit unveiled in East London last year. She beat three other artists to this year's prize. Heather Phillipson explored our relationship with nature in an eerie, apocalyptic world. Non-binary artist Sin Wai Kin looked at issues of identity through a boy band in which the artist played all four members. And Ingrid Pollard examined racism in the UK in part by looking at pubs named The Black Boy. Artists are undervalued, I think. So this is a chance to get out there, to have a look at what artists are doing now, to bring it to public attention and to really try to engage the public in debate about their response to the work. Liverpool played host to the Turner Prize tonight for the first time in 15 years, a celebration of contemporary art in a city at the heart of British cultural life. Katie Razzle, BBC News, Liverpool. Now, the time has just turned uh, 10.30. Some of you may well be aware that the Met Office has been issuing quite a few weather warnings today to do with the cold weather. Helen will tell us more. Hi, Helen. <laughs> Hi, Hugh. It's been a bit of a shock to the system, really, though, hasn't it, after how mild it's been? But I uh, just pulled up Aberdeenshire recently, starting to see some lying snow. That's the main risk of snow in the north, but it's cold for all of us. And as Hugh said, there are widespread warnings out for icy patches in particular because the frost will be widespread. Why? Well, you can trace our air right the way back up to the Arctic on these northerly winds. So they're with us to stay. They're throwing the snow showers in across much of Scotland, as we saw there in Aberdeenshire, even to low levels. There are a smattering of wintry showers elsewhere, but it's the north where we're going to see the most significant snowfall. But Many places could see a smattering over the coming few days. It'll certainly be cold enough. Those warnings out widely for ice as well. Of course, anywhere we've seen the showers and where the roads and pavements are damp, it'll be icy as well in the coming few nights. So those showers come through thick and fast overnight towards the north. There'll be one or two more for Northern Ireland, perhaps western and eastern areas. But anywhere they fall, it's going to turn icy, isn't it, with a widespread and pretty sharp frost as well. So a really cold start tomorrow morning. Scraping the ice off the cars could be a little bit of mystery. But as I say, snow and ice are main weather hazards if you're travelling. And through the day, probably a few more showers for Wales and the southwest compared with today and Northern Ireland. And a few more later in the day, turning to snow over the hills in the North York Moors, the Wolds, and possibly at lower levels later as they drift down across Scotland into the northeast of England. And then tomorrow night, where you saw the temperatures, it's going to drop like a stone. We could see a few flurries of snow even further south. So although mostly in the north and around the coast, there could just be a smattering inland. And it's going to be another cold night tomorrow another cold day then on friday plenty of sunshine around but it gets colder still at the weekend and that is because we pick up some freezing fog so if you want to keep up to date on what the temperatures are doing where you are day and night you can head to the app hugh we've been warned helen thanks very much um, well that's it on bbc news at 10 on wednesday the 7th of december uh, more analysis, of course, of the day's main stories coming up on BBC Two, on Newsnight, which is actually just on air. There we have Victoria, Victoria Derbyshire, just uh, opening the programme there and meeting some of the guests. That's on BBC Two. On BBC One, all of our colleagues in the nations and regions standing by with the news where you are. But from everyone here on the 10 team, it's good night. <laughs>